my pleasure to introduce to you Derek Hamilton, a stratification economist. You heard from Manuel a little bit of the nature of his work. He's an associate professor of economics and urban policy at the New School for Social Research. Please join me in welcoming Derek Hamilton. Thanks, Alan. All right, so I have some tough acts to follow. I will not have the comedic levity that uh, Manuel put up. Um, I guess one joke was a, a, the fact that in the title slide you saw my picture, so rather than putting people up there, I would vein and put myself. Um, <laughs> all right, let me get right into it. In terms of economic security, wealth provides the beginning and the end. It is the primary indicator of economic security. Wealthier families are better positioned to finance elite independent school and college educations, access capital to start a business, finance expensive medical procedures, reside in neighborhoods with higher amenities, exert political influence through campaign finance, purchase better counsel if confronted with an expensive legal system, leave a bequest, and withstand financial hardship resulting from any number of emergencies. Wealth provides the financial agency over one's lives. Simply put, wealth gives you choice. It provides economic security to take risk and shield against financial loss. Data from the Federal Reserve Survey of Consumer Finance indicates that the top 10% of households own about three quarters of the nation's wealth. Moreover, the bottom half of households own about 1% of the nation's wealth. That's a novel way of thinking of the 1%. But what is frequently overlooked is that these disparities are even more pronounced when one considers race. In fact, race is a stronger predictor of wealth than class itself. For instance, black and Latinos collectively make up about a little over 30% of the US population, but collectively own about 7% of the nation's wealth. Progressives, progressives often make economic productivity arguments to justify a greater emphasis on economic equity. I think such arguments are valid, but they're context specific. For instance, it's hard to argue that the enslavement of my ancestors didn't contribute to this nation's growth. Um, I prefer the Reverend Dr. William Barber's equity framing that economic justice is a moral imperative. With such an approach, economic inclusion becomes an explicit goal regardless of context. Basically, we need a societal shift from overemphasizing economic austerity and growth, which leaves vulnerable the vulnerable workers vulnerable to the fickle contingency of what's called trickle-down job creation. Instead, to promote economic mobility, we need to prioritize economic equity, fairness, and what the Nobel laureate Amartya Sen has called human capabilities, where we measure our economic health of our nation based on how well we enable all our citizens to attain their self-defined goals. The emergent dogma of our society is based on a faith that markets are somehow natural, transparent, efficient, and inevitable. This belief does not give enough attention to the political actions that form and codify markets in the first place. Instead, the presumption is that markets are simply, instead, the presumption that markets simply are natural leads to the false notion of fairness that somehow if each individual is free to pursue their own profit and happiness, that they will ultimately lead to the greater good for society. Markets, whether they're product markets, labor markets, or financial markets, are presumed to be self-regulating the most astute, the most valued, the hardest workers are believed to prosper and endure, while the least astute, least valued, and laziest are presumed to receive their just rewards and simply fade away or have to do something else over time. These presumptions pay little attention to the roles of power and in initial capital and how that power and in initial capital can adjust to alter the rules and structure of transactions and markets to privilege that power and capital in the first place. It is silly to presume or assume that those with power and capital are simply price takers. Economists should do a better job of understanding political economy, including power and initial endowment. 
and be more keenly focused on understanding and advocating for structures that truly lead to more equitable and fairer distributions. In addition, the economics profession has fallen short in understanding the role of group identities, such as race, gender, and their, and their intersections, as they relate to material and psychological well-being. For the most part, economists view group identity as prejudice, as some prejudice that's exogenously determined, a matter of taste, some binary that represents bigotry or ignorance. It ignores the agency and benefits that individuals have in choosing and investing in their collective group identity and how social structures may increase or decrease to value or increase that investment in that identity, such as race or gender. Without such an analysis, the economics profession is more than complicit in continued trajectory towards stratification, both within and across nation state. As the Haitian filmmaker Raoul Peck points out, we live in a world where Bill Gates' net worth exceeds 30 years of the, net of the GDP of Haiti. This is antithetical of what the Reverend William Barber has in mind when he talks about economic justice as a moral imperative. Nonetheless, our long trend towards inequality is not without tension. This past election seems to represent at least a rebellion, albeit a far from a full overthrow of, of this system. The presidential election, election victory of Donald Trump caught most pundits and political scientists off guards. However, if the election is viewed from the perspective of stratification economics or critical race theory, the results become less surprising. President Trump's campaign slogan of making America great again and his signal that I am your last chance with clear overtures to the pending demographic shift in which whites will no longer be a numerical majority was all about codifying the property rights and whiteness. Stratification economics notes that there are many intermediate economic and psychological benefits associated with distancing oneself from their outgroup towards an in-group identity, in this case, a white American identity. In fact, that helps explain why Trump received more than half of the women vote and 30% of the Latino vote, despite clear overtures towards writing demography or saying, uh, saying uh, d derogatory things towards these groups. I don't have to go through them. <laughs> um, the theory recognizes that identities are multifaceted and not so dichotomous. As such, there is incentives for members of the out-group to try to identify with the in-group to the best of their ability. Political pundits have also attributed Trump's stunning vi victory to a populist mandate. Well, we know that Hillary, the demographic for which Hillary won was those that earned less than $50,000. For the other demographics, there was no clear dominant, although Trump won, there was no clear dominant between the two candidates. Two things are unambiguous from racial stratification. One, black workers are made worse off. And two, the capitalist class, which is overwhelmingly white, is made better off. What is ambiguous is the economic positioning of white working class. White privilege, in other words, the notion that we could, we will unambiguous, white, white working class will unambiguously benefit from coalition Sadly, I don't know if that's true. Be, and the reason why it's not true is because there are real benefits associated with the property rights and whiteness. Of course, if you have a coalition between the working class, you have a greater movement that can fight the structures that disproportionately benefit the capitalist class in comparison to the working class. But I want to emphasize that there are tangible examples of white privilege and property rights and whiteness. And they include the fact that blacks who live in families where the head graduated from college typically have less wealth than white families where the head dropped out of high school. Other examples include Diva Pager's study that demonstrates that white males that signal prior incarceration have a greater rate of employment callbacks than black males who did not. As well as the fact that black expectant mothers who graduated from college have a greater likelihood of an infant mortality than white expectant mothers who dropped out of high school. In terms of wealth, the absolute racial wealth gap exceeds $100,000. The typical black family owns about eight, dollars per, eight, eight cents per dollar of the typical white family. 
And when it comes to liquid assets, financial assets that can be readily converted into cash, black and Latinos are nearly penniless. Black families have about $200 in median liquid assets in comparison to $23,000 for white families. Moreover, if we remove retirement savings from liquid assets, then the typical black and Latino families have about $25 and $100 respectively. That's little financial cushion to deal with expected and unexpected budgetary shortfalls. $25 in savings would not be enough to feed a family of four for one day. Much of the framing around the wealth disparity, including the use of financial services products, focuses on the poor decision, poor financial choices and decision making on the part of largely black, Latino, and poor borrowers, which is often tied to a culture of poverty thesis regarding their undervalue and low acquisition of education. That framing is all wrong. The directional emphasis is wrong. It is more likely that meager economic circumstance, not poor decision making or deficient knowledge, constrains choice itself and leaves poor borrowers with little to no other option but to attain and use predatory and abusive alternative finance. Financial behavior and financial literacy are practically useless when you have no finances to manage in the first place. Furthermore, the regressive and predatory fines, fees imposed by local governments to balance their fiscal budgets often extract rather than empower black and Latino households with their limited assets. Also, what we conceive of traditionally as good and bad debt has different implications once we consider race and the prevailing framework of targeting unprivileged racial groups with inferior housing and education products, predatory finance, as well as ongoing housing and labor market discrimination that limits the choice set and rate of return on home ownership and a college degree based on race and ethnicity. The intergenerational racial wealth gap was structurally created via discriminatory and exclusionary policy and has virtually nothing to do with individual or racialized choices. The source of inequality is structural, not behavioral. Intrafamily transfers provide some young adults with capital to purchase a wealth generating asset like a home, a new business, or debt free college education that ultimately will appreciate over their lifetime. Access to this non, is non merit based seed capital. It's, based on, it's not based on some action on the individual, but rather inaction on the part of the individual and the familial position in which individuals are born into. So I'd be remiss to discuss racial disparity without mention of mass incarceration. Since 1970, there's been at least a seven-fold increase from about 200,000 to 1.5 million inmates in state and federal prisons. And this is not counting the 700,000 incarcerated individuals in local and county jails. The disproportionate share of the incarcerated population is composed of black men. Black males make up about 6% of the U.S. population, but roughly 50% of the incarcerated population. There's a one in three chance that a black man will end up serving time at some point in his life. Rather than being a source of earnings for their family, the spillover effects of incarceration amount to a further drain on household budgets. So let me shift gears a little bit. Midway through his 213 commencement address in Morehouse College, President Barack Obama invoked the black American legacy of triumphant leaders who, without excuse, were able to overcome tremendous structural barriers and achieve great things. So I don't have the eloquence of Barack Obama, but I'm going to quote from him. You now hail from a lineage and legacy of immeasurably strong men, men who bore tremendous burdens that still laid the stones on the path on which we now walk. You wear the mantle of Frederick Douglass and Booker T. Washington, Ralph Bunch, Langston Hughes, George Washington Carver, Ralph Abernathy, and Thurgood, Mar Thurgood Marshall, and yes, Dr. Martin Luther King, Jr. These men are, were many things to many people, and they knew full well the role that racism played in their lives. But when it came to their own accomplishments and sense of purpose, they had no time for excuses. The president continues that inspirational speech to the graduating class at this elite, historically black college and university by stating that every one of you 
have a grandma or an uncle or a parent who's told you at some point in life, as an African American, you have to work twice as hard as anyone else if you want to get by. So I ask, at what cost? Are there economic and health consequences associated with above, above normal efforts for these highly educated, racially stigmatized black graduates in the context of a racially stratified America? The emerging consensus is that, so, is that social determinants of health, which the World, World Health Organization defines as the conditions in which individuals are born, grow, live, work, and age, are the primary determinants of health and likewise health disparity. We got to talk about health today. Hence, the presumption is that if a greater share of blacks and Latinos invested more in good education, which in turn would result in better jobs and higher income, then the health disparity would dramatically reduce and, or, or be eliminated. Education is positively associated with better health for all Americans. However, racial disparity in health persists and even worsens at higher levels of education. For instance, as I mentioned, black expectant mothers have a higher infant mortality rate with a college degree than white expectant mothers who dropped out of college. The pattern of disparity is not limited to infant mortality. Racial mortality differences persist across many major disease types, including cancer, heart disease, stroke, HIV rates. And disturbingly, and more alarmingly, these disparities rise with higher levels of education. So if we look at strata of education, the gaps get wider. There are physical and psychological costs of stigma and ironically exerting individual agency, working twice as hard to get by. That explains, that I conjecture, explain the role of, the limited role of education and income as protective health risk factors for blacks in comparison to whites. The added effort of stigma imposed by high achieving black Americans that threaten the relative position of the dominant white group may translate into deleterious health and economic conditions for these high achievers. For instance, I'm actually gonna skip this in the interest of time, but I'll try to paraphrase a little bit. Sherman James talks about John Henryism, and it's based on the fable where the African American male overcomes his circumstance and beats the steam machine with his hammer and prevails, it's the classic man over, uh, man over machine fable. But what happens to John Henry at the end? He dies, he dies of heart disease. Um, he dies of heart failure. So the unfortunate irony is that blacks who put forth the highest effort to cope with their difficult circumstances are perhaps the ones at the greater, of, of the greatest risk. The prevalence of neoliberal and post-racial thought, both framed in the politics of personal responsibility which emphasized individual agency, particularly self-investment in education as the pathway towards open mobility and efficient social dis distribution, might literally be bad for black people's health. Similar to health outcomes, there's a pattern of persistent or worsening racial disparity in economic outcomes with increases in education. A report by Janelle Jones and Mike Schmidt entitled, A College Degree is No Guarantee, indicates that the unemployment rate for high achieving recent black graduates exceeds 12% and is as high as 10% for these black recent graduates who graduate with a science, technology, engineering, or math related major. Over the past 40 years, regardless of education, the black unemployment rate has remained roughly twice that of the white rate and rarely dipped below 8%. Black Americans are in a petrol, perpetual state of employment crises. In spite of these enormous disparities, the presumption remains that if blacks were more responsible, made better financial choices, and more focused on education, they could get a good job as a pathway towards economic security. Our research brief entitled Umbrellas Don't Make It Rain, Why Studying Hard and Working Hard Isn't Enough for Black Americans, critiques the preponderance of research and public policy that asserts that education and hard work are the drivers of upward mobility as it relates to racial and ethnic disparity. We find that black families whose head graduated from college have only about $23,000 in net worth, which is about eight times lower than that of white families with a college degree who have about $180,000 in net worth. In fact, those same college graduates have only about two-thirds the wealth 
of white families where the head dropped out of high school. So like infant mortality, a college degree is positively associated with wealth within race, but it does little to address the massive racial wealth gap, the wealth gap across race. In essence, education is not the antidote for the enormous racial gaps in wealth and employment. None of this is intended to diminish the value of education. There's clear intrinsic value to education, along with a public responsibility to expose everyone to a high quality education that teaches them to synthesize and fuse information into big ideas with encouraging teachers trained to deliver that curriculum from grade school through college. It is a myth that black families do not value education, but also problematic is the societal overemphasis on the economic returns to education as the panacea to address socially established structural barriers of racial economic inclusion. So despite the persistent enormous racial disparities, the public sentiment is that the civil rights period, which outlawed blatant forms of de jure discrimination, has largely transcended the major racial structural barriers that exist. It is, is as if that passage led to conv conventional explanations went from biological to cultural determination. Political discourse upheld by Democrats, Republicans, blacks and whites, emphasize these things on the part of blacks as the explanation for disparity. I'm going to skip a little bit because in the interest of time and then find where I want to pick up. So um, we often put forth cases of black success of elites to make the case of some grand racial progress. The, the ascendancies of these individuals become an allegory of hard work, merit, efficiency, social mobility, freedom and fairness, and personal responsibility. These cases of black exceptionalism are meant to serve as prima facie examples of what individual and familial acts of perseverance and hard work can achieve. The problem with these convenient anecdotes is that they're self-fulfilling and lack the systematic use of proper counterfactuals to empirically validate or invalidate their conjecture. There is no accounting of the voluminous number of black Americans who exemplify perseverance, grit, and hard work, but do not attain successful economic outcomes. This all follows from the neoliberal perspective where the free market, as long as individual agents are properly incentivized, is supposed to be the solution to all our problems, whether they're economic or otherwise. Political scientists in Joe Sauce, Richard Fordham, and Sanford Sham, in their book, Disciplining the Sport, De Deplore, describe neoliberal paternalism where the state serves the paradoxical role of structuring most aspects of society to adhere to laissez-faire market tenants, while at the same time serving the role of poverty governance for poor. Here, the state uses incentives and sanctions to coerce or discipline the underclass, not working to eliminate poverty, but rather to manage their seemingly bad behavior with increasingly punitive tactics. Stigmatization based on race provides the political fodder to implement these harsh and punitive controls on the underclass because of their marginalized social status and overrepresentation in poverty. Blacks become the symbolism by which the surplus population characterized by persistent unemployed, unemployable, and a source of urban crime and melees and whose subsistence needs to be a drain on fiscal budgets becomes defined. The neoliberal paternalistic frame provides the rationale for austerity policy. Um, I'm gonna skip along. I'm gonna refer you to stratification economics as an alternative to this frame. I will say that with stratification economics, race prejudice constitutes a defensive reaction. It is a protective mechanism that serves the function of preserving social hierarchy or enhancing the relative position of the dominant group. In other words, it is not a matter of taste and preference, but it is a structural mechanism to maintain social hierarchy. Ultimately, the myopic overemphasis on individual optimization and the underemphasis on group formation and collective action leads conventional economics to accentuate difference in individual attributes like human capital endowment, motivation, and attitudes as explanations for intergroup disparity. Stratification economics looks beyond these individual factors and investigates structural and contextual factors that preserve the relative status of dominant groups via intergenerational resource transfers and other exclusionary policies. So let me conclude. I got a minute. Take a breath. 
Despite the social and political emphasis on education as the means of social mobility, the evidence is clear that when family background is controlled, blacks acquire greater educational credentials than their white peers. Yet they reap less economic and health returns for these same credentials. The cruel ironies is that post-racial, politics of personal responsibility, and neoliberal paternalism tropes, which all emphasize no excuses, grit, hard work, may actually exacerbate economic and health disparity, particularly for those that pose a competitive threat to the preferred position of the socially dominant group. In order to address the dramatic racial disparities in health, particularly at higher levels of socioeconomic status, we need to put the rest, the rhetorical metaphors, like John Henry, the black man over machine, and instead focus on the business of eliminating social structures where an individual from a socially stigmatized group have to, in the former president's words, work twice as hard just to get by. So in the Q&A, I have a list of various policies which I call universal race-conscious policies where we can actually lead to some of this economic inclusions and economic justice as a moral imperative for which William Barber has suggested. Thank you.